And although if you are a Christian and you do this, you won't go to hell, there are still going to be eternal consequences. Hey fam, it's Rachel. Today on Crack Your Bible, we are continuing our series about dining at the table of demons, and we are speaking with Kevin, who is a missionary to Egypt. He's currently back home between trips in New York City. And before you watch this series, I will ask you, can you please first watch part eight? And it is actually just a smaller chunk taken out of the interview that you're going to see today. I have like 90 minutes worth of footage with Kevin, so I'm splitting it up into multiple videos. But please watch part eight first because so many Christians today are being misled by people who dine at the table of demons and tell you that you don't love Jesus enough or you don't have enough faith or that you're just not a good Christian if you go seek out the care of a doctor or a mental health specialist, or if you take pharmaceuticals to treat an illness, and that could not be further from the truth. These people are trying to destroy you before your time because, you know, a lot of people were angry saying, well, if you tell people that they won't go to hell if they do this, then that will encourage people to commit suicide. That is absurd, number one. And number two, we don't add to the word of God so that people won't do something that we don't want them to do. That would be called a fence law. And Adam did that in the Garden of Eden. Oh, God said, don't even touch the fruit. Well, when you add to the word of God, look what happens. Eve touched the fruit and she didn't die. So she figured everything else Adam told her was a lie. And we've already talked about that right up here. So when you lie, even if you have good intentions, well, that backfires on you. And remember, there's a saying in English that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. We do not add to the word of God. And no, we absolutely don't want people to commit suicide. I, I want you to seek out emergency services. I want you to seek out a doctor if you ever have feelings of self-harm or you feel suicidal or you hear voices in your head or something like that because there's not always a spiritual reason for why people are experiencing these symptoms. Sometimes you could have a hormonal imbalance. You could be getting the incorrect amount of nutrients. You might not be producing the right amount of hormones. Uh, you could have a tumor in your brain. Your thyroid might not be working. You could have a parasite. There's all different reasons why you might be having these feelings, but you won't know why and you won't be able to treat them correctly and effectively without the proper diagnosis from a licensed prof medical professional. And this is why I ask, please stop listening to the lies of the devil because he wants you to be cut short. He wants your time to be sh cut short because... The whole reason we're here on this earth is to do God's will. And every single believer is going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and have to give an accounting for every thoughtless word or deed that they ever did. So even if somebody commits suicide, that is not a sin where you would lose your salvation. Because over in 1 John five seventeen, Jesus says, All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. And he's not talking about physical death. He's talking about death in the sense where you're cut off from God. Because, yeah, obviously not all sin leads to physical death. This is exactly why Adam and Eve, they ate the fruit and um, they didn't see that they physically died. <laughs> but uh, they were spiritually cut off from God. And that's what true death is. That's what the second death is. You're cut off from God because it's appointed unto man wants to die, everybody's going to physically die. There will be a day where everybody physically dies, whether or not um, they have turned to Jesus or not. But there are certain sins that people will do um, that are not going to cause them to physically be cut off from God, where you're showing that the fruits that you are bearing uh, show that you haven't been transformed by the Holy Spirit, that you weren't saved or that you have decided to no longer believe in the Holy Spirit. So 
Um, that's where a lot of people get it wrong. So even though suicide is something that is wrong and all things that are wrong are sin, uh, this is not going to be something that you lose your salvation on. But remember, we're all going to have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an accounting for every thoughtless word or deed that we did. And this is exactly why Satan wants to cut you off before your time. Because when we have to stand before Jesus and tell him, you know, what we did with the talents and the gifts that he gave us, we are going to be rewarded or penalized for our works. Even though we're saved, we're not saved because of our works. We do good works because we're saved. We are going to be rewarded or penalized for those works. We'll still be saved, but in God's new millennial kingdom, we are going to be kings and priests unto our God, and we are going to have heavenly rewards. And these rewards are going to be crowns and we're going to cast them at Jesus' feet. And we want Jesus to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You don't want to cut off your own life. This is the only life that you have. This is the only time where you have a chance to gain crowns that you'll be able to cast at Jesus' feet. You don't want to stand before the throne of God empty-handed. You want to say, Jesus, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. Not because I'm a good person, but because I love you and I want to honor you. And I want to do your will. So Satan wants to tell you, number one, don't go see a doctor. He'll tell you not to take medication or that you're a bad Christian if you do these things. And it's not true because he wants you to cut off your life, your time where you can make the most impact tearing down his kingdom so that when judgment day comes, you don't have anything to show Jesus. He wants to make you empty handed when you stand before the throne of God. And that's why it's important to stand firm on the word of God. It's important to put on the full armor of God every single day. And when the fiery darts of the devil come in, what do you do? You wield the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, <laughs> at him, and you can take that down. That's why it's important to crack your Bible. Because the enemy is coming in and he is here to steal, to kill, and destroy. And although if you are a Christian and you do this, you won't go to hell, there are still going to be eternal consequences. So... I I don't want you to stand before the throne of God empty-handed. I know that God, what God has started in you, he is going to complete. But you have to be a willing participant. So please, 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 please go check out part eight where I do a sermon specifically talking about these things because there's too many people who are twisting scripture, adding to the word of God, and trying to tell people that their loved ones are in hell. And that's just not true. It's just not true. And we have to remember that um, there's lots of different reasons why people take their own life. Sometimes they do it for altruistic reasons, just like Jesus did. He laid down his life for us. He said nobody took it from him. He did so himself. Um... You know, like in battle, some people will save their whole team by throwing themselves on a grenade and it saves their whole team. Or maybe somebody jumps in front of a moving car to push a, a stroller out of the way so, the, so a baby doesn't die. You know, there's lots of different reasons that people will sacrifice their own life. And even though that is suicide, that is not sin. Taking your own life for non-altruistic reasons, not to save other people... It's totally satanic. Totally satanic. And that is not something that I would ever advocate for. And I just know that you can get through this because you have the Holy Spirit there with you. You can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. So anyway, I've already talked about this long enough. Please go check out part eight in this series before you watch this episode. And if you have... Let's just jump right into this interview with Kevin, and I would love it if you would like, subscribe, and share, and think about who you can share this video with. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.
Hey fam, it's Rachel. Today on Crack Your Bible, we are talking about dining at the table of demons. And throughout the series, we've talked about all the different ways that people who consider themselves Christians dine at the table of demons. Now, what is dining at the table of demons? This is where you are in fellowship. This is where you are in covenant with Satan's kingdom and you are doing things to further his kingdom rather than the kingdom of God. And we know that scripture tells us you can't dine at the table of demons and dine at the table of the Lord. You can't drink from the cup of demons and drink from the cup of the Lord. So if that is true, then we need to know what is dining at the table of the Lord, which we have already covered in our communion series right up here for everybody on desktop and mobile. And of course, links are always in the description box below, but we also need to know what is dining at the table of demons. And that is what we are here to expose because Ephesians 5.11 tells us to have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. We are not ignorant to the schemes of the devil. This is why we are here to expose them. So one of the ways that people dine at the table of demons is they are silent. They do nothing. And when you do nothing for God's kingdom, you are giving your support to the enemy. And we know that scripture tells us do not be hearers of the word, but be doers also. So with that said, I have one of the doers of the word here with me today. I have a guest that I actually met at my New York meetup in back in February 2019. And his yeah. name is Kevin. And let's have him on right now. So hi, Kevin. I'm hey, so Rachel. happy to see you. Oh, man, this has been... This has been a long time coming. We tried to set this up like so many different times. It just it just didn't work, but I'm so happy. I know. <laughs> and every time that it doesn't work out, all of a sudden you tell me like, oh, well, when I was supposed to talk to you, I actually met this person and <laughs> talked to them about Jesus. And I'm like, you do you. Yeah. I know the Holy Spirit had other plans. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah. It was, it's, every time we were supposed to link up and like do this interview, like something came up or someone... Um, I met someone on the street or someone need to hear the gospel. So it's, you know, it, it works out. <laughs> it works out at the end of the day. Right. And one of the reasons that we weren't able to talk for a while is because you were in Egypt. Now, yeah. of course, we talk on the phone, but not when you were in Egypt. <laughs> so anyway, um, I want people to get a little bit of background about you, who you are, what you do, and then tell us a little bit about why you felt led to go to Egypt and why it's so important to not just be a hero of the word, but be a doer mm -hmm. also. Well, so I grew up, I was raised Catholic. And so, you know, you know the same regular story of anyone who's raised Catholic, like you're, you're just raised in traditions. And I think I always had a sense of God's presence, who he was, but I, I did not understand what it meant to like really seek God, what it really meant to follow him. And so in a series of events, I think it was only until like about after high school that I really started to like seek God for myself. I wanted to know why was the Bible true. I had a lot of friends who were raised Catholic, left the faith. Um, my best friend left the faith, literally. I, I still remember the day he came home from school. He's like, yeah, I don't believe in God anymore. And so things like that like shook me because I'm like, how do you not believe in god anymore like i i don't understand and um but those things it just strengthened me like it, my questions and my doubts and my skepticisms only like led me to dig deeper whereas i noticed for some people it was like the exact opposite questions and doubts like made them walk away and um uh ecclesiastes really says like god has placed eternity in the hearts of men and like that became extremely true for me when my best friend of 13 years had committed suicide and um, this was another friend. And so I think it was at her death that I really started to like really question, not faith, but really went, okay, what is the purpose of life? Um, I think only death can do that. Um, and so really it was at her funeral when I, like when I really saw like the impact that she had on people where there was literally only standing room. Um, people had to leave so that people outside can come in. And I asked the Lord at that time, I said, God, have I really impacted the people in my life? Like, has if the gospel of, is that strong and that powerful? And um, and she she had left the world untimely. I'm like, but your gospel is so powerful, it's so strong. 
she and I know her. She preached the gospel to everyone she met. She was she had a Muslim background and she gave her life to Christ. Not um, I think when she was around like 13, 14, when we became so this friends. was a Christian who committed suicide. Uh huh. Yep. Yep. And so I really wondered. I was like, wow. Like she she didn't she didn't really tell me really necessarily her struggles. And I still remember the day before it happened. Um, it was like a movie scene. We were in school. She was walking through the halls because a friend a week before that um, had overdosed, one of her close friends. And she was just walking through the hallways, like really despondent, really sad. And I asked her, I was like, hey, like, are you okay? Like, are you doing all right? And she's like, yeah, I'm just walking through the hallways. And I said, listen, if you need me, just call me. Cause we were very close. Our family were close. Our sisters and our brothers were close with each other. And she said, yeah, of course I'll call you. She walked through the, the, the library doors. I click, literally clicked the elevator. I turned around and I watched her walk through the doors. The elevator closed. And literally that was the last time like I really saw her alive. And at her funeral, I was really, I really, I questioned purpose. I questioned meaning, but I, I didn't question the gospel, but I, I asked the Lord, I was like, God, if even in her death, uh, people were able to come out and they had me speak at her funeral. And um, I, of course, preached the gospel at her funeral, but I, I, I was looking at the crowd of people, like, like the room was so full. Like people were standing, people were leaving so that people outside can come in. And I said, God, if your gospel is this powerful, like I really, really want to experience more. I want to um, stop you right here because yeah. I know a lot of people watching this are immediately going to have the same question. And that is, is it a sin for a Christian to commit suicide? Are you going to go to hell? And I just want to let you all know, no, mm. like committing suicide is not the unpardonable sin. Yeah. Rejecting yeah. the Holy Spirit is. Yeah. And there are always going to be times where it seems like this life is just too hard. And I know that Elijah, he felt yeah. that way where it was mm -hmm. just like the stuff that I'm going through is just too much for me to bear. And yeah. Yeah. he met Jesus on the mountain and it, it was just like, I can't do this anymore. I can't do this anymore. And mm -hmm. finally God relented and said, okay, then we're going to get your successor, Elisha. Yeah. And he took him up in a chariot of fire. But I know that suicide is not the answer. It is so damaging to families. And if you are considering suicide, don't. <laughs> Please don't. Because yes. we know that First yeah. Peter 5 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that mm -hmm. at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all yeah. your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Right. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Yeah. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after mm -hmm. you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and yep. ever. Amen. Amen. And just know, like, God knows what you're going through, and you can cast your cares on him. You don't need to listen to the lies of the devil, because we know that the adversary is here to steal, to kill, and destroy. And he wants to take you out before your time, and you have more crowns to gather, yep. to cast yep. at Jesus' feet. Don't mm -hmm. let Satan come in and lie to you. That's why it's so important to put on the full armor of God every single day yeah. so that when the enemy comes in and he tells you that you're unloved, that you are a bad person, that uh, you can never be good enough for God to love you, you can remember that Jesus Christ died for you. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that's why I, I tell people, take communion yeah. every day because it reminds you, not because this is something you have to do, but it's a reminder to you that every single lie that the devil tells you, that he whispers in your ear, God doesn't love you. You're not yeah. good enough. Yeah, You see that that's a lie when you look at communion because it shows me that Jesus is sinless and he is blameless and I'm not, but he loved me so much that mm -hmm. this is what he did for me yeah, and that I'm part of his family. So I know that's a little aside, but I know people are going to have that question and i just want to uh, let you all I'm know so, 
You're I'm not so going to go to hell if a family member committed suicide, even if they were a Christian. But again, stand strong against the schemes of the devil. Yeah. Resist yeah. him and he will flee. No, absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I just, I just, just to add to what you said, um, that, I think that was one of the questions that a lot of people are like really pondered at her death was like, hey, where is she? Where is she? Where is she in hell? I'm like, um, Jesus' sacrifice outweighs what she did. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think really during times like that, when people are extremely stressed out and they're even contemplating suicide there, they really feel like God has forgotten them. And one of my favorite verses during that time was literally Isaiah 49, 15 to 16, where he says, you know, can a, a mother forget her nursing child? He's like, just as a mother cannot forget her nursing child, so can I not forget you if I've written you on the palm of my hand? So if there's anyone on, you know, listening to the stream or just rewinding and watching this again, God has not forgotten you. He's not far from you. He hasn't forgotten you to the point where he gave you his son ahead of time. He, and that whole chapter is talking about the restoration of Israel. And if God is promising that he was going to restore his own people, he's going to restore you. And so please do not give up. Life is worth living. Christ died for you so that you can have life and life abundantly. Do not give up. And, um, and he knows your yeah. name. He knows Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I really do. Like it was really during those times where scripture, although there were times where scripture just didn't make sense. It was the only thing that I hung on to because it was the only thing that really, really stirred my heart to keep going another day. And um, upon her death, um, I was in the process of going into the army. So I said, you know what? I want to go and try and make as much of a difference and be as much of a light as I possibly can in any arena. And so the Lord opened up doors for me to be an army chaplain. So I was studying for that. I was going in for that. And um, a, a couple things happened even in the midst of like basic training. I ended up losing my MOS, ended up losing my job, which is crazy in and of itself. And Do you so, want to explain what an MOS is? So MOS is just like your job. It's just a fancy way of calling you a job in the army or in the military. And so um, my MOS was 92 Alpha. I was a logistics specialist. And so like I was in charge of like uh, – carrying big equipments, very heavy, but also very expensive equipments here and there to different parts of the world. And um, it was in training that I really saw, like through basic training, I really saw the extent, not just of sin, but like despair. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of my, uh, a lot of my battle buddies, they're, they were incredibly despondent. Some of them were um, suicidal. Um, many of them were trying their best to do whatever it could to just get out of basic to training because people go into the, the military thinking one thing and they actually experience another. And so now were they despondent because this was like this was their kind of last option. I know that can be yeah for some many some of the people, people like go into the military. Yeah. Yeah for many people that's exactly what it was. It was their their final option. Like like you really hear sad stories like someone one of my battle buddies, they were homeless, and so they came in um, hoping for a better life. And so people have different reasons as to why they go in, but most of them are wrong reasons. Um, literally, if you are, I honestly believe, if you're not called into the military, you just, just don't go. And um, we, I experienced a lot of uh, dark moments with a lot of battle buddies, but it was through the darkness I re really understood what it meant to be an ambassador for Christ because – if I did not know who I was in him, if I did not personally have a relationship with him, I don't think I would have been able to survive basic, let alone be able to speak life to my battle buddies. Um, two out of like the 60 of my battle buddies are really hard to talk to. I end up bringing to church. They gave their lives to Christ. And so it's like, it's only in the, the midst of darkness that light tends to make sense. And the gospel comes alive in the eyes and hearts of people. Mm -hmm. Um, and so in the midst of that, God somehow, I don't even want to get into the whole story, but I eventually <laughs> end up leaving the arm, leaving the military. Um, but before that, I ran into uh, this organization that I found out they were really sending people, not just overseas, but to the Middle East to preach the gospel. And so for immediately, I'm thinking, wow, these people are crazy. I need to know more because you hear the gospel and you know what the last words of Jesus it was to go into all the world, preach the gospel, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, literally, that was his last words. That was his last commands. And so, like, if if you're about to leave and you're speaking to, like, your, your best friends, your family members, 
you don't want to just tell them something that makes no sense. Like, hey, feed my cat. You know, make sure the dog is okay. <laughs> uh, make sure you pay the bills. No, you want to tell them something important. And to Jesus, that was the most important thing he told his disciples. It was, I need you to preach this gospel to all nations. Like that was his heart. God's heart is for all nations. And so. It's um, his desire to see everyone saved, that no one should perish. Absolutely. Absolutely. And when, when you really understand, you see the vision of God's heart, that's what you want. Like that's, that's literally the only thing that will, will literally drive you to, um, do the things that these people are doing, which is not just going to the nations, but you're hearing stories of Muslims who are leaving Islam to become Christian because they, they understand what it's like to live in complete abstract darkness, which is what Islam is. And they give their lives to Jesus. Um, just, just, I, I want to get into what I want to just give this small testimony of this Muslim girl. I'm not going to reveal her name um, in Egypt. She became a Christian, was baptized, and she would just go into mosque and preach the gospel. Mind you, she's a woman, right? And so in Islamic nation, there are a lot of things women can and cannot do. Oh, and mosques she, are gender segregated. Right, right. But she didn't care. And her reasoning was, I was living in complete darkness all my life. She's like, I finally found the gospel. And I see the light and I'm prepared to die for it. That's her confession. And well, when you it's hear, not, I want to die for this. It's, I love these people so much and yeah. I love Jesus so much mm -hmm. that I don't want to do anything or I don't, I don't want to waste an opportunity to tell them at least yeah. plant a seed because yeah. they need to know that Jesus is Lord and he yeah. wants a relationship yeah. with them. Yeah, absolutely. And like you hear, you hear testimonies like that almost all the time. And so when I found out, okay, there's a, there's an organization that really focuses on sending people to what we call the 1040 window, um, which is basically the Middle East. It's places mm -hmm. like Turkey, Tunisia, um, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, Egypt. And you go on small short-term mission trips to just preach the gospel to people who've never heard it. And the amount of testimonies you hear, the amount of testimonies that I have, the just the amount of people that you really encounter in the nations that just have never really heard the gospel. Like, and, and you'd be amazed, you assume, oh, like everyone's heard the gospel. I'm like, no, no, not everyone has heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's staggering, um, but you really understand, I was reading Romans 15 and I just wanna read it. One of Jesus' main issues was the fact that this was spoken of years ago, like all, all, all throughout the Old Testament, especially in the book of Isaiah, where he's like, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles. Sing to your name. He's like, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the people exalt his name. And Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. This was spoken about centuries, millennia before um, we even come to the picture. Like Jesus' That's why heart, it's important the to know the Old Testament. Yes, like you just you have to. <laughs> yes, you just have to. Like this was this was foretold. This was the mystery that Paul talks about, the mystery that was revealed since before time began, that the Gentiles would worship the Lord. Not just mm -hmm. the Jews, but the Gentiles. And so when Muslims hear the gospel, when we hear the gospel the first time, it's something sparks alive into us because we're dead. We know we're dead in our sins and our trans transgressions. We are dead to God, but the gospel is the only thing that makes us come to life again through the power of the Holy Spirit. And when they hear the gospel message, some reject, some have this vitriolic response, but there are others, there's a remnant, like Paul mentions in Romans 11. There is a remnant that has not bowed their knee to Baal. There's a remnant that the Lord himself saved for himself for the saving of many. And it's, and Isaiah 19 is a whole prophecy about Egypt. Mm -hmm. And the entire chapter is talking about Egypt. But towards the end, like, oh, I, I just have to read. Like, towards the end, in verse 19, he's like, In that day there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar to the Lord at its borders. It will be a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. And that when they cry to the Lord because of oppressors, he will send them a savior and a defender 
and deliver them. And so is Egypt will come to a point because when you go to Egypt now, it's like, it's like a dump. <laughs> so, yeah. That was the first thing I asked you when I called you or when you called me, yeah. I was like, I know that everyone thinks of the pyramids or whatever, yeah. but yeah. I've heard that it's just covered in trash everywhere. Yeah, Wild is, dogs, cats, you know, whatever. Yeah. yeah. It is covered in dirt. It's just dirty. There's garbage everywhere. Like the sanitation like system is almost non-existent. If you just have trash, you just throw it on the street, you know? And so literally Egypt is just, it's just a dump. But, and it's proof positive that God works through doctors because you yeah, don't go yeah, to Egypt yeah. without getting vaccinations. Yeah, you just, <laughs> you really just don't. Honestly, you really can't because. Uh, we'll die. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, honestly. And so like Egypt is such a place right now where it's, they're so oppressed, but because of Islam, because they have the chosen. Right. That is in charge of Islam that is over mm -hmm. Egypt. And then. Yeah. You have all of the gods of Egypt that are still venerated and honored yeah. because they're in all the shops. Yeah. And we know that mm -hmm. God said that he was bringing judgment on the gods of Egypt mm -hmm. all the way back in Moses's day. Yeah. And as long as those gods, which are just mm -hmm. demonic principalities, these people don't worship gods. They, they worship demons. Paul yeah. tells us um, as long as they are still venerated and they have a place of honor, they still have power in those places. Yep. And, Again, Satan's here to steal, kill, and destroy. So that is exactly the mission of his kingdom. And mm -hmm. we see it in Egypt today. Yeah, absolutely. And nothing, nothing's changed from, from literally biblical times. I mean, we're still in biblical times, but nothing has changed since, <laughs> since the book of Isaiah. Nothing has changed since, since they left. Nothing Egypt. new under the sun. There's nothing new sense. under the sun. And things actually for them will get worse. That's what the prophecy in Isaiah 19 will say. It will get worse to the point where they have to cry out. For someone to save them and that's exactly what god does he sends them a savior he sends them a defender and there's only well, one savior <laughs> yeah and there's jesus. only one defender and that's jesus and there will come a time where they will cry out for him specifically only him because they'll come to understand he's the only one that could save them mm -hmm. and um the the chapter ends by saying that in that day there will be a highway from egypt to Assyria, the Assyrians will worship with the Egyptians, the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians, and then Israel will come and worship with them. And so we see this whole intertwining of nations that will come together and worship God. Nations that don't get along. Right, right. Like, right. They still Na don't get along currently. Don't. Nations that are that are literally at war as we speak, that want each other dead, or should I say that wants one nation dead, that is Israel. And, um, as we as we see in scripture, God has a plan for them. Right. God has a plan for Egypt. He has a plan for Syria and Iraq. He has a plan for his own nation, Israel. And so being in Egypt was, oh man, it was such a, I don't want to say a breath of fresh air, but you really see what it's like to be a Christian. You really mm -hmm. understand what it means to worship. You really understand what it means to follow God and die to yourself, pick up your cross and follow him. Um, our first experience of worship or at church, um, it wasn't even, literally we were in our apartments and we had to close the doors, shut the blinds, pick up the mattresses from the floor and like put them against the wall. And that was our worship. And we had to do that to prevent our neighbors next door from hearing us worship in the name of Jesus. And my worship that night was just tears. Because you don't experience that in America. You don't experience that in New York. I'm from New York. You don't experience that here. There's no mm -hmm. type of persecution there. But there, if your neighbors were to even so much, literally as possibly here, you lift up the name of Jesus. Not only can they call the authorities, but you can be deported quickly. And Does easily. anybody want to remember why Daniel was thrown into the lion's den? Yeah. They heard him praying. Uh, it was his yeah. name that pitched on him yeah. because yeah. nobody was supposed to bow to anybody else. Oh. But the king and Daniel's mm -hmm. like, mm, I don't care. But he didn't put a mattress against the door. He nope. still, yep. he's still gonna pray. Yep. And um, God did not prevent Daniel from going into the lion's den. But while he was in that den, it was God who shut the mouth of those lions. So he's always mm -hmm. with you through the fire, kind of yep. like Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. He didn't take him out of the fire. He didn't prevent them from going through that. But he was there with them. Yeah. through the fire there were four yeah. people in that furnace and 
the fourth person was Jesus. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so man. just remember, he's not going to take you out of these situations. He promised us persecution and tribulation, mm -hmm. but he's going to be there with us through the end. He's never going to leave us or, for, or yeah. forsake us. Yeah. And that's, that's something that we really saw firsthand being there because we, not only did we experience like the spiritual oppression, because like I was saying before, when you're in these nations, like you don't, you feel it. Like you literally feel, you feel, you hear the call to prayer five times a day, 10 minutes at a time. Literally the minute it comes on, like you, you, you feel it upon you. Like it's almost as if like, it's trying to like grip you. Mm 